eastern Antarctica near Casey Station. This is no carefree summer on the coast. Scientists are braving a hidden world entombed in thick ice to investigate a looming catastrophe. They want to discover if Antarctic marine life can survive ocean acidification. We'll increase the acidity for a period of 10 to 12 weeks and see who are the winners and who are the losers in potentially in our future oceans. Seemingly small changes have massive consequences. The changes that are happening to our planet now are just so much faster than what we've seen in the geological record. Ocean acidification has been called the other CO2 problem, or more sensationally, global warming's evil twin. It's directly linked with what's happening in the atmosphere. The last 50 years have seen an accelerating rise in concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide. More CO2 in the atmosphere inevitably means that more dissolves in seawater, increasing the acidity. Oceans are acidifying more rapidly than at any time in the last 300 million years. When CO2 dissolves, it reacts with water to form carbonic acid, carbonate and hydrogen ions, which decreases the pH. On average, surface pH has already dropped by 0.1 since 1750. We're expecting to see, by the end of this century, a change of 0.4 pH. That doesn't sound like much, but it's actually roughly two and a half times more acidic than, than the ocean currently is. Of all the carbon dioxide soaked up by the oceans, most has been by the Southern Ocean. It's deep, windy and rough, so compared to other oceans, more water is stirred up and exposed to the atmosphere. The water is cold, and the colder the water, the more CO2 it can dissolve. So polar waters acidify the fastest, which brings Johnny Stark and his team to Antarctica for the Free Ocean Carbon Enrichment, or FOS, experiment. What we're doing is we've got these specially designed um, seabed chambers, four of them, which we're deploying onto the seabed um, over existing communities of, of animals and plants. And two of those chambers will be acidified and two of them will be controlled in sort of ambient conditions. This site has been selected because the thriving seabed is less than 20 metres under the ice. Things like sponges and starfish and sea urchins and sea cucumbers, all the sorts of things that you'd find in other parts of the world, but these are unique species to Antarctica. The success of the experiment depends on the sea ice staying stable and not breaking out. And it's a challenge to install. Equipment on the surface has to be connected to the chambers on the seabed through a small window in the ice. All right, it's going down with a lift bag on it. So the sea ice that we're standing on is a fantastic platform. We've got about two and a half metres of sea ice here, so it's very thick, very strong. 69 large cylinders of CO2 will add to the carbon dioxide already in the seawater to simulate the concentrations in a future ocean. Each of these chambers is connected to a 40 metre long duct. The acidified water is introduced at one end and it mixes with the local water that's flowing through that duct. It's tough, painstaking work for the team of 10 divers in freezing temperatures for an hour at a time. But there's nothing quite like diving under ice. When you first get into the water early in the season, underneath the ice, the visibility is just incredible. We're talking hundreds of metres of visibility. It's kind of hard to estimate how far you can see. Water's very still and everything settles out, which means by the end of winter, it's very, very clear. And the aim is to keep it that way. Each long yellow duct is fed into the water to the divers who suspend it from the ice ceiling. It's a feat of coordination above and below to stretch them out to their full length before lowering the ducts slowly to the seabed. The trick is not to drop them. There's a really fine layer of silt on the bottom over the top of everything. We're trying not to disturb that because that could influence the experiment. The four perspex chambers are eased through the hole and carefully taken to the seabed to be hooked up to the pumps. 
The target pH in two of the chambers is about 7.7, 0.4 units less than the current pH, making it more acidic. That's the level at the end of this century if our emission rates don't change. Testing its effect on a patch of Antarctic seafloor is the first experiment of its kind in the world. But what of the ocean depths where small crustaceans swarm in vast numbers? With a population size of about 800 trillion, the Antarctic krill is one of the most abundant animals on the planet. They may not be huge, but their combined weight is greater than all the humans on Earth. And while they're food for everything that's bigger than them, the krill are the powerhouse of the entire Antarctic ecosystem. In their lab near Hobart, Rob King and So Kawaguchi put krill eggs to the acid test. We found that if you expose krill eggs to high concentrations of carbon dioxide, they simply don't hatch. And the question then was exactly at what point does that occur? Where is the tipping point for Antarctic krill embryos? The answers they found are alarming. If we continue to emit carbon dioxide in a business as usual case, then by the end of this century, in some of the major spawning areas for Antarctic krill, we'll see hatch rates drop to 50% of their current level. And then by the year 2300, we'd expect to see less than 2% of the current hatch rate, which is really a collapse of the, of the ecosystem because krill are just so key. The knock-on effects of krill collapse are dire. If we really decimate the krill population, then the animals that are perfectly designed for eating krill, such as the great baleen whales, the blue whales, the fin whales, the minke whales, they, they surely are going to reduce in numbers. Krill are particularly vulnerable because their complex life cycle exposes them to naturally higher CO2 concentrations in deeper water. Eggs laid at the surface have to sink to a depth of at least one kilometre before they hatch. Krill then go through 11 larval stages as they ascend to the surface to feed under sea ice. New tests will see how CO2 affects their swimming behaviour. They can't start feeding when they hatch. They've got to get all the way from 1,000 metres deep to the surface with the reserves given to them by the female krill that laid them. So if they're having to put a huge amount of energy into controlling pH balance inside them, they might not have the reserves to make it all the way. But one thing is already clear, and it offers some hope. If we go for a low emission scenario, that's where we are very confident that we'll be able to uh, limit the hatch rate reduction to only about 10%. Back in Antarctica, the FOS experiment is in its final stages. It's running right now, it's acidifying as we speak. It'll be really interesting to see what the results are. That's why we're doing this experiment, to get some kind of idea of what our future ocean might look like and what we might have to start doing now to help protect it. Check our website for updates on the Antarctic experiment as the results come in and find out more about the secret lives of krill. <laughs>